Balsa wood is an incredible material. Not only does it rival metal in its structural efficiency, but there's a massive range of densities to choose from. Here is a series of balsa strips, all cut to the exact same size, arranged from least to most dense. The lightest one weighs 0.156 grams, and the heaviest 0.734 grams. To put that range into perspective, if the density of the 0.156 gram stick was aluminum, titanium would be 0.261, steel 0.454, copper 0.518, and even lead would only be 0.656. Of course, balsa wood does not behave like all those different metals, but how does it behave as you increase in density, and which range is generally best for building these science olympiad structures? Through years of experience building various structures, I have learned generally which range of wood density is best, but I wanted to see if I could collect some objective data to explain why that is. It is quite difficult to build a test rig that will test pure tension or compression accurately, but it isn't difficult to test bending strength, which is a pretty good indicator of overall strength, at least for balsa wood. I have carefully measured the mass of all the sticks to milligram accuracy, and I'm using my tension load cell hanging from the middle to measure the weight it holds before breaking. Even though the load cell isn't extremely accurate, what I'm after here is relative performance, so as long as it's consistent, that will be good enough. Here is a video of the test process. I start by putting the sticks centered between the two pieces of wood and hanging the load cell. Then I zero the load cell and carefully pull down until it breaks, recording the stick mass and load. This particular test held 582 grams. Here is one holding 165 grams. And another that held 1,352 grams. Once I had completed testing for all the pieces, I had some nice raw data spanning a large range of densities. Here is a plot of the raw data I collected, which shows the mass of the balsa stick on the x-axis and the weight it held in grams on the y-axis. As you can see, the result is very linear. The r-squared value of 0.97 shows very good correlation to the linear equation shown. Before we go any further, I think it's important to spend a little time understanding what this line equation means. First, the 2771.3 coefficient on x is the slope of the line, and that is the same as the efficiency, weight held divided by mass. But what does the y-intercept value of minus 350.13 mean for us? First off, my raw data didn't account for the dead weight of the load cell after I zeroed the reading, so we need to account for the extra 52 grams at each data point. That effectively shifts this line up, so the y-intercept is minus 298.13. Regardless of what exactly that number is, it's telling us that there needs to be some non-zero mass before it can hold anything at all. If we were to solve the line equation for x, it would give us an x-intercept telling us the minimum mass required for zero load. Of course, at some point, this line wouldn't be linear. If you could actually get a piece of balsa that weighed, say, 0.05 grams, it would hold a tiny amount. But for the range of densities we're dealing with, this linear model is a great fit. So now that we have a good model of mass versus weight held, we can take the next step and look at something more interesting. Because we know the volume of the test pieces, we can convert the mass into density on the x-axis. I have also converted it to pounds per cubic foot, which is a unit that is often used when buying balsa at places like specialized balsa. On the y-axis, I have converted weight held to efficiency by just dividing by the mass. The non-zero y-intercept from before is causing this efficiency graph to be curved like it is. So while the efficiency continues to increase with increasing density, there are diminishing returns. My experience has always led me to use light to medium light balsa for the best results with important structural components, and this graph nicely illustrates that. If I overlay the ranges of how specialized balsa categorizes density, you can see where the sweet spot is for increasing efficiency, definitely in the light to early part of the medium range. Now, it's very important not to read too much into this data. 
Remember that I'm looking at the exact same dimension pieces. If this was all that there was to it, you'd conclude that it would always be best to use the most dense material cut down so the mass was what you would want it. What that is not taking into consideration is the shape, which also plays a critical role in function. Take this classic boomy design, for example. When the loading block is applied at the end of this device, there's a huge vertical bending moment applied to the beam. The tall vertical beam pieces do a much better job at resisting that moment compared to the square sticks shown here, even if those sticks were higher density and the same mass. All is not lost, though, as we can directly apply this knowledge when we have loading conditions that don't really depend on geometry. One such case is the pure tension members we often see with devices like bridges. Here, if we have a mass budget of around 0.45 grams, it would be much, much better to use the 1 16th inch square basswood piece instead of the balsa stick. If we do the math, the density of the basswood is almost six times that of the balsa here and would correspond to an efficiency of around 475 compared to almost 2400 for the basswood. So what can we learn from all this? My recommendation would be to try using light to medium light balsa for most primary members of your device. Stay away from the really light balsa as its efficiency is too low for our purposes. If you have a pure tension condition, use high density balsa or basswood cut down to your desired mass budget. And finally, don't forget about the importance of component shape in your designs. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this look at balsa density versus efficiency. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments.